Welcome to this video lecture. Uh, here we're looking at the Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigation, 5th edition. This video is chapter 10, and that focuses on virtual machine forensics, live acquisition, and network forensics. Now, again, keep in mind this is a basic, just introductory to these topics, not an in-depth review. Objectives are explain the standard procedures for conducting a forensics analysis on a VM, describe the process for live acquisition, explain network intrusion and unauthorized access, describe standard procedures in network forensics, and network monitoring tools. All right, so let's jump right in. An overview of a VM. So what's a VM? A VM has two major flavors. We have a type 1 and a type 2. So the VM and kind of how it sits is important. Is it sitting directly on the hardware? And does it require a separate operating system? Or does it rest on top of an existing uh, OS? So for example, if you're dealing with VMware Workstation, that's a type 2 hypervisor because it rests on top of Windows or it rests on top of a different operating system where type 1 is loaded directly on the bare metal, that's going to be things like ESXi, assuming that you are familiar with VMware products. So VM, uh, especially in today's network, in today's world, is extremely important because more and more devices are being done in VMs. A lot of server, a lot of cloud computing, a lot of uh, more efficient utilization, or even virtual desktops they're all going into VMs. So it's important to understand what a VM is and how, how to actually uh, obtain it. So again, typically we're dealing with type two hypervisors. It kind of really depends. If, we do, if you're doing business forensics, type one is very common, but it just kind of depends. Uh, again, type one will be like ESXi, type two will be more like VMware Player or VMware Workstation. All right, so type two hypervisor. Uh, so basically you'd be installing it on top of, let's say for example, Windows. Uh, normally what you wanna make sure that you have before you do that is things like, does your processor support virtualization or some type of virtualization technology like VT or the VMware extensions, things like that. Because they help increase the uh, efficiency for virtualization handling. Uh, common ones are gonna be like virtual PC, VMware Workstation. If you're dealing with a Mac, Parallel, here's an example of a type hypervisor. This is gonna be VMware Workstation or VMware Player. Hypervisors have very specific extensions though this one is more focused on VMware, hence the VMX file, the VMDK, that's the virtual disk, and then there are some other ones in there as well. Mostly widely used uh, hypervisors. Uh, I'm not gonna say virtual box, I'm sorry. Uh, it's common, but not, I wouldn't say the most common. Virtual box is one of the, the big ones. Type two hypervisors do come with templates for different operating systems. So you can actually have it load like a, a template for Windows 7 or a template for Windows 8 or Ubuntu or anything. Again, uh, each type of hypervisor has their own file associations. Here are the file associations for our virtual box. So how do we conduct an investigation using our type hypervisors? That's the important part. Okay, so this is where this kind of gets a little bit weird. Uh, this is saying by linking the VMware's IP address to log files, you can maybe determine websites. Honestly, a VM is just like a computer. The VM internally will have its own log files, so you can uh, view the log files within the VM to verify website uh, locations and addresses and things like that. You treat a VM like you would a real computer. And as long as you do that, then you should be fine. To detect whether a VM is on a host computer is lock the user or documents folder, or look in, 
but that's not always the case. Uh, host registry, again, not always really the case. Honestly, if you start looking for common VM or a uh, common VM configuration files, like if you're dealing with VMware, you'd be looking for those VMX files. That will help determine if it's a if there's a VM on the device or not. You can't just assume it's going to be in certain directories because they don't have to be. Also, you may want to look for the existence of a virtual network adapter. Is there a network adapter? In addition to searching for network adapters, you need to determine whether USB drives have been attached because the VM may be on the USB drive. You can have nested VMs. You can actually have a VM inside of a VM inside of a VM. Normally, you would be, uh, if you're doing a VM acquisition, image the host computer, locate the virtualization software, export the, uh, the host machines and all files associated with the VM, verify hash values, hash values, open the VM as an image by itself, that way you can create a forensics image for the VM. You can also do a live acquisition of the VM, which there are more often necessary because they'll include all the snapshots and everything like that. Make sure you include the snapshots if need be. Doing the live acquisition of VM is important to make sure the snapshots are incorporated and not damaged. Follow the steps in the activity in, the, uh, in our book. We'll be doing videos on this later down the line. Other VM examination methods could be looking at the forensics tools that cover uh, our imaging. We've been using the FTK Imager and OS Forensics. Both of these can mount VMs on an external drive so that the analysis can be done directly on the, uh, the VM itself. Using a VM as a forensics tool can also be important. You can follow again steps on 402 for that portion. What about dealing with a type one hypervisor? Having a good understanding of networking and system, it, this comes into play if you uh, have that background. Type one hypervisors are directly installed on hardware. So this makes it a little bit harder because you're gonna end up dealing with bulk storage more than likely. So the capability is limited only by the amount of memory and storage. So you're, if you're doing business type forensics, understanding type one hypervisor is extremely important. I use ESXi because I'm a VMware certified and I do most of my work through type one hypervisors, again, ESXi. But there has been times where I've had to do a analysis on a type one hypervisor where I had to capture all VMs on that type one hypervisor was more of a pain, but because I understood how it worked, it made it a little bit easier. Common type uh, hypervisors are going to be uh, VMware's ESXi. I'm sorry, vSphere is the management portion, but it's ESXi and vSphere. Microsoft has Hyper V, Citrix has Zen Server, Apple has Parallel. And again, both of these have, or some of these have walkthroughs in our book. A more common way is live acquisition. They're very useful when you cannot deal with turning off a machine. Live acquisitions don't follow the typical the forensics procedure. So they actually have what's called an order of volatility. How long a piece of information lasts on a system because for example, you may not be able to restart the system. You may need to be able to capture the image of the live system right now before the data disappears. And restarting it or powering it off would destroy that data. Example, information that's in memory. Common steps for uh, doing a live acquisition is you uh, make sure you have a bootable forensics disk. Don't 
know why you need a bootable for the VIX disk, because if you're doing a live acquisition, you can't really boot from it. Make sure you keep a log of all your actions. A network drive is ideal, preferably. Copy the physical RAM. Next step varies kind of depending on what you're investigating. Be sure to get forensic digital hashes of all files that you're trying to recover using the live acquisitions. Several tools that are out there. Kali has it. Uh, there are a few RAM uh, options as well. Uh, GUI tools are easy to use, but you don't always get uh, accurate readings, hence the hash values. Command line tools give you way more control. Do keep that in mind. Network forensics. This is the process of collecting and analyzing raw network data and traffic uh, throughout the network. Intruders leave a trail behind. You just have to understand how to find that trail. Though typically network forensics have dedicated courses just on it, just because this is a very broad area. The network forensics examiners have to establish very specific uh, protocols and procedures to acquire data. So essentially to ensure all compromised systems have been found, there has to be a structure in place. Procedures must be in place for the organization and Typically, you can follow the appropriate NIST guides for uh, integrating forensic techniques into incident responses to kind of help address these uh, needs. Because again, you're not, re you're not redoing the will, you're kind of working off of it. If we're talking about securing a network, which we're transitioning this chapter into, Layered defenses. One layer is not enough. You need to have multiple layers because you do not know uh, the exploits that can happen at different layers, so it's easier to layer it up. Defense in depth. Make sure you have a very similar uh, approach to like how the government functions. They have protection modes for people, technology, and operations. They've got policies and technical. They got policies and controls for each of these layers. Test your network. Make sure that your network is secure. You can actually have contract uh, pen testers come out to verify. But again, realistically, small networks may not be able to afford this. Network forensics can be a very long, very tedious process. So again, procedures. Standard procedures that are typically used is an installation image fix any vulnerabilities, attempt to retrieve any of the volatile data, acquire all compromised drives, compare files on the forensics image to the original installation image, which again is not very common anymore. Uh, you can have system images, but how quickly do they change in your environment? In digital forensics, you can work from the image to find most of the deleted or hidden files where in network forensics, you must restore some of the connections. Have to love malware, which that's going to be a whole other series of videos after these ones. You also still have log files. Uh, you can do a PC dump or Wireshark to examine network traffic. You can also uh, look at uh, server logs, router logs, firewall logs, system logs, and a ton of other types of logs. You have a lot of network tools that are at your disposal. You have some system internal tools, uh, which is, again, a collection of Windows tools that are free, like Regmon and uh, Process Explorer and FileMon and things like that. Tools from the PS Tool Suite. Uh, things like uh, under, uh, understanding the uh, security identifiers, understanding passwords, maybe even changing passwords, things like that. This is where this slide starts getting really dated. Packet analyzers, things like uh, Wireshark, TCP dump, they can be used to examine headers. Here is a TCP header. Though it's not very clear, and this is actually kind of dated. 
common packet analyzers is going to be Wireshark. To use a, a, a packet analyzer, you can follow the appropriate steps in our book, or you can stay tuned for later videos on Wireshark. It will capture, well, it's more about the installation. Uh, it can capture data or TCP, actually it can capture network traffic, TCP and UDP, for you to be able to analyze later or analyze on the fly, it kind of depends. Moving into examining honeypots, honeypots is a project that was developed to kind of have people that are attacking your network kind of get into and stuck into. That way, they're not really attacking the overall network, they're just kind of attacking your honeypot, which is more like a fake network. Don't know why, but we start talking about things like denial of service attacks and how they uh, work. Basically, you have lots of machines trying to target one machine or one device. That way, they can uh, bring those resources down. Zero day attacks. A zero day attack is a common threat, it's a vulnerability that no one knows about. Hence the uh, zero day. Honey pot, honey walls that looks like a common or a very tasty uh, portion of a network. That way it will draw in hackers and crackers or to other forms of attackers to kind of look at them. That way they start focusing on those areas instead of your real network. And that is this chapter in a nutshell. We talked about the different types of hypervisors. We talked about VMs. We talked about live and network acquisitions. We talked about the honeypot project and Wireshark a little bit. And that is the end of this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.